Software Engineering Daily is sponsored by Hired.com. If you're looking for a job, Hired.com is the place to start. I've used it personally, and it is an excellent service. Software engineers and designers can get five interviews in a week with top companies. Go to Hired.com slash Software Engineering Daily for a $4,000 bonus upon accepting a job. Thank you, Hired.com. Apache Flink is an open source platform for distributed stream and batch data processing. Stefan Ewan is a committer to Apache Flink. Stefan, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Hello, thanks. I'd like to ease into our conversation about Flink by first talking about streaming and batch. Mm -hmm. In the context of a modern Hadoop ecosystem, how do you define streaming and batch? Okay, wow. So you, you probably hit the hardest question first. (laughs) <laughs> um so so streaming is a is a pretty is a pretty widely defined thing actually there's 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 many aspects to it in a lot of people when they hear streaming what they think about is you know real time low latency kind of applications but it's actually it's actually a lot more so data streaming is in some sense uh a, a paradigm that that this data processing in the way that it embraces the fact that um, that all data is actually created usually in S streams, right? I mean, there's, there's not really a use case where all of a sudden it dumps a terabyte of data on you, right? It's, it's usually <laughs> created over time as events and, and streaming just is, is a paradigm where you say, okay, I'm actually processing the data as that, as an unbounded, timely sequence of events. I'm not trying to, let's say, um, groom it into into sort of daily chunks and then run a batch job over it. But I'm actually I'm recognizing this fact. I'm, I'm dealing with the I'm dealing with the continuous and unbounded nature explicitly in my data processing programs. So that that in in some sense is a lot more than what what many people think of in at, when they first think about streaming, right? It does definitely comprise the the low latency um, applications, the the event driven applications, but it's it's also it's also um, a lot more. And so interestingly, streaming is the way we see it actually a superset of batch processing. Yeah, your documentation says that basically it says mm-hmm. batch processing applications run efficiently as special cases of stream processing applications. So what, right. what does this mean? Batch processing applications run efficiently as stream, as special cases of stream processing applications. Um, okay, so w- what it means is the following. You, you can think of, you can think of, let's say, batch processing over a set of files in something like S3 or Hadoop file system. Um, you can think of it as a stream of data that is not actually unbounded, but that is bounded. It's finite, right? And and interestingly, a lot of parts of the application do even in batch exploit this. Think about it. If you run something like a MapReduce job, it actually consumes the file as a stream. It um, parts of the of the pipeline are going to be record at a time, and then and then in some parts usually materialize and do batch data exchanges. So what what Flink actually does is it it follows the streaming notion as as long as possible. It it streams data between, for example, mappers and reducers if you have a MapReduce case, or between joins and core groups. In, um, in in other programs, and it it really materializes only when the semantics of an operation require that. For example, if you do um, a full aggregation or a sort and so on, something where you need to consume the entire input before producing anything. This has a blocking nature, and everything else is is, is streamed through. Interestingly, um, this is a paradigm that the modern systems are doing. I mean. A lot of parallel databases used to do this for a long time. Also, the systems like Impala are doing this under the hood. So they're, 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 even though they are executing use cases that are associated with batch, they're using a lot of streaming technology under the, the hood. And, and, and Flink also followed this pipeline. As the streaming at the core, and it, 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 uh, it puts the batch on, on top of it as a special case of a, of a finite bounded stream. So we will get into more of the uh, intricate details of Flink, but first let's zoom out and give me a definition for, 
for what Flink is? Give me a high level description. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty much what what you also said before. Um, as as the description on the website, let me let me try and make it a little more crisp. Um, it's a streaming data flow engine. Um, it's a powerful streaming data flow engine that you can tune both for for throughput and for low latency with with programming abstractions for batch processing, for stream processing, and in stream processing with very powerful primitives for for dealing with unbounded nature, time, time of processing, time of events, and so on. And is Flink a replacement for any components of the Hadoop stack? I, I would I wouldn't say it's necessarily a replacement for specific components. There are a lot of things that people are doing with other frameworks that you can definitely also do with Flink. But one one thing that it certainly does is it, it opens up um, use cases that that I don't think any other system in the in the open source handles uh, these days. And it has the potential definitely to simplify a lot of um, a lot of infrastructure um, setups where where people are um, are putting together things like Hadoop and Flume and then Spark and so on. And these these can actually be be neatly expressed as streaming jobs in Flink. So, uh, what are these new use cases that Flink is able to address? Yeah. So. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it. We're we're releasing actually the the next version of Flink these days, the 0.10 release. It's being voted on uh, as we speak, actually. So it's being tested and voted on by the by the Flink community and the and the PMC. And what um, what this release adds is is a few very very interesting um, primitives to the data streaming side. Um, it it introduces a windowing mechanism that. I think is more flexible and powerful than, than anything you find in any other open source um, framework for streaming that allows you to do very complex forms of, of aggregations, um, pattern detections, and so on, based on time, on elements, on data data characteristics in, in intervals of, of time. And at the same time, it has, um, it has something that... Um, something called event time, support for, for something called event time, um, event time is a is a paradigm that is that is getting a little more well known um, as of late, uh, thanks to Google having published quite a few papers on on their efforts on streaming technology, and it is a very prominent part of that. It's also a very prominent part of Flink as of the of the new release. The idea behind event time is that you process data in the streaming system, not with respect to the time that it arrives in the streaming system, but with respect to the time that it occurs in the real world. And you try to, to, define, mm. to define bounds on the, on the lag, how, how data arrives from the, from the devices that produce events to um, how long it takes before it reaches your processing engine, what, what is the maximum lag, you try to bound it, you try to, to implement um, your logic to, to handle this, to be able to to deal with approximate, explicitly deal with re- approximate results, and um, yeah, basically make this make this lags of time and so on explicit in the application, and that is a that is a very a very powerful thing that makes yeah that I cannot say it any differently, but that makes makes the dealing of time very explicit in the application rather than very imp- implicit in the way that a lot of pipelines have it right now. You know, you chunk the you chunk the file at midnight and say this goes into that batch, that it goes into the other batch. If you happen to have any latecomers that are in the second batch, there's a lot of custom logic to compensate in hindsight for that. And all of these things become just very naturally expressed in the in the APIs if you start dealing with event times. Event time sounds like that's basically as explicit as you can get when you're dealing with time, um, which is pretty pretty interesting. But you also mentioned that Flink allows for simplification of certain distributed um, Hadoop architectures. What what is the simplification that you get when you add Flink to your Hadoop architecture? What are you what are you replacing or or augmenting? Um, yeah, I think it it is multiple things. So first of all, what you don't need is multiple frameworks to cover the spectrum of use cases from low latency to 
let's say more uh, yeah a, a medium latency of seconds with with more ex more powerful handling of the streams to um, to to classical batch processing you can do actually all three of those things in flink a low latency reaction to individual events with millisecond latencies or milliseconds tens low hundreds um, you can do the the stream processing with windowing and aggregation with um, with event time with latencies in in the, in the seconds and you can you can do the the classical batch processing and even iterative algorithms on graphs for machine learning and so on it it all fits very well in the framework that is that is one thing so um you typically don't need something like uh let's say an, a hadoop job or plus a spark streaming job plus a um plus a storm job to go from um to to navigate the entire spectrum right um to go from low latency over over other streaming to that to um to heavy batch or so um another thing that that is a, a pretty common observation is that what the pipelines, the data pipelines people are building are using batch technology, but are actually streaming pipelines in disguise. So, so every time somebody um, writes a job that, um, that ingests data and rolls files on, a, on an hourly or a daily basis, and then you have a, a scheduler in the background that schedules in Hadoop or a Spark job to process these files and produce different files and then then what you're really doing is actually you have a continuous pipeline, a streaming pipeline. You you do window it by hour, and and you're sort of you're sort of using batch as a yeah as an as a streaming in disguise, right? You're you're scheduling periodic batch jobs, which really are streaming windows, for example. Mm -hmm. That is that is one thing that that a lot of people interestingly do. And if you have a powerful streaming framework, that you don't have to do it again. It's something that is implicit um, in in this architecture. It's a combination of the batch shop plus the scheduling cron job or whatever. And in the streaming framework, it's a very explicit windowing definition um, done. Yeah. Is, is Flink a generalization of Hadoop MapReduce? Um. Yeah, you can you can you can think of it like that, but in but in many ways, I mean, yeah, Spark was also already a generalization of that, if you think, and in the yeah. sense that that Flink is a streaming framework, and and we truly believe streaming is a superset of batch. You can think of it; it's a generalization of. Sure. Yeah. So so Flink implements the Kappa architecture. What is the Kappa architecture? Um, so the it's actually interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if there is the definition of, of, of a Kappa architecture. The, the <laughs> term actually goes back to um, goes back to the people behind Apache Kafka, um, and it is sort of their response to the design pattern of the Lambda architecture, right? The, mm. the Lambda architecture being the idea of combining uh, a batch system and a streaming system. Um, Together with the batch system, just the heavy lifting periodically, and the streaming system basically covers for the the delta since now and the last batch job. Or yeah, um, the the Kappa architecture. This term, I mean, it's clearly related to lambda architecture, right? The the term yeah. comes from from the from the idea that the lambda architecture is really a workaround because of not very powerful stream processors. Once you have a powerful stream processor. There's not really a need to combine a batch system and a streaming system. You can just do it completely in the streaming system. Everything that is the that is the idea of the of the Kappa architecture. And in some sense, you can you can think of of Flink being a, a following that idea because yeah, I mean what what we are building is a is a powerful streaming system that allows you to do these things, so you don't have to have a batch and a streaming job. Yeah, got it. So I'd like to talk some about how Flink integrates with other Hadoop components. I get the sense that many listeners, in fact, myself is included in that, um, don't totally have a holistic view of how the Hadoop architecture works. But one thing I understand is that Apache Flink runs on top of HDFS and Yarn, which are two important components within the Hadoop ecosystem. Can you describe what HDFS and Yarn do and, and describe why Flink relies on them? Um, okay, so Flink actually does not necessarily rely on them. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, you can you can use Flink completely independent of the entire Hadoop 
stack or the let's say the technologies that are usually included in Hadoop distributions. Um, the only exception is if you want to run in a, in a highly a high availability mode, um, you're either relying on Yarn or on Zookeeper. But for for most of the of the cases, definitely for all of the uh, non highly available batch processing or so, you, you can run completely independent uh, from Hadoop. So you can just bring it up on let's say on on the Amazon cloud or on the Google cloud and just rely on on their file system. Done. No no. Um, no dependencies on Hadoop. I mean, that being said, the well, basically all use cases we see for Flink are in in conjunction with um, with other Hadoop tools. So, if you run batch jobs in Flink, chances are very good that the input data for that batch job is in HDFS and the output data is in it goes back to HDFS, right? Um, most people don't install frameworks like Flink on their cluster anymore, right? They have a, they have Yarn or Mesos or something like that running. Um, Flink is not yet deeply integrated with with Mesos, um, so I'm, I'm going to stick to the example of Yarn. Um, and and what they really do is they they basically bring up the the workers to to run a job through Yarn rather than installing Flink daemons on on the machines. So it's it's really integration with the with the Hadoop systems tuning rather than heavily or uh, critically relying on these components. Mm. Why do users uh, choose to implement Flink on top of their pre-existing Hadoop rather than uh, like implementing it separately from their pre-existing Hadoop system? I think that's mainly a a thing of where is your data, right? If your data is in HDFS and uh, you have yarn running on this cluster. It's just the simplest thing to do, mm. like that, right? Um, yeah. In on the streaming side, actually, the the most prominent technology that that people use Flink with is actually Apache Kafka, the um, message queue slash log um, that that basically uh, collects and persists streams, and and you can use Flink to to consume these streams, transform them, analyze them, and also produce streams back to Kafka. Um, again. If the if the data in this in this case the streams are in Kafka, the simplest thing is to run Flink also there where Kafka is in that cluster, because the data is already there. Sure, got it. So let's talk about the distributed runtime of Flink. Um, mm-hmm. How are jobs managed? Um, how are jobs managed? Um, what what in detail do you mean by that? People mean very different things when they ask that question. Do you mean like so? So I'm very- I'm so I'm trying to do some sort of uh, some sort of distributed uh, like multi multi stage machine learning process. Um, how do the different jobs uh, within that uh, process get run within Flink? I guess and managed. Um, okay, more specifically. From the standpoint of like a distributed system, the responsibilities of a master node and the worker nodes, and how these different distributed components are working together. Ah, got you. Okay, so um, yeah, so Flink follows a pretty classical master worker pattern. Um, what what it does is, um, if if you have a job, let's let's assume it's a streaming job, um, that is a continuous streaming job. Um, you, you write this as a, as a Java Scala application, and then you submit it um, to, to a cluster for execution, let's say to, to a Yarn cluster, right? It will bring up a, a master node. Um, so so the, the client program will connect to Yarn, bring up a master node, in this case the application master that's also running the, the Flink master then, and will we'll give it the, the data flow description of that program. That The data flow description, we call it the, the job graph, basically defines... Um, what operators are executed in what parallelism with what configurations and parameters, how the individual operators exchange data streams, and so on. So that is that is given to a master node that basically keeps the overview of which operators are running where, um, what the state is, are they healthy, if they failed, if they failed, um, it takes care of um, of redeploying them, it, it coordinates checkpoints, and so on. And then there's, um, in addition to that master node, a set of worker nodes that um, that the, that register at the at the master node. The master node becomes aware of them. They offer their resources, and then the master can deploy individual operators to these nodes. 
Um, so it's it's fairly it's it's fairly straightforward. There can also be multiple multiple masters, out of which one is always the the elected leader coordinator, and uh, in the failover case, the the responsibility um, falls over to to another master node if one goes down. How does Flink maintain fault tolerance? Yeah, um, that is a that is a very interesting question. It does it it does it a bit differently than than most other systems. Um, Let's talk about about streaming for tolerance because that's really the more tricky tricky part. <laughs> um, so what what we added in in, in Flink was um, was a was an, a novel um, a novel me- a method to do fault tolerance via distributed checkpointing. So the idea is the following: you have this data flow, this streaming program going on, right? You have some transformations here, data streamed to some operators that do Windows, then to some syncs that may interact with the database and so on. And you want to make sure that in all in all failover cases, you, you give strong semantic guarantees, like there are no duplicates introduced um, to give these exactly one semantics. Um, at the same point, you don't want to be tracking too much intermediate metadata don't want to do too much bookkeeping because it, it just costs and will decrease throughput if you do so um what what we're doing in flink is we're basically defining these checkpoints which are uh, which is a collection of um of states that are consistent with each other right so it defines in my input stream i have been exactly at that position um all records that have been before that position in the input stream have been reflected, let's say, in this in the state of this window aggregate in, in, in the counter that I'm maintaining there. Um, all records that are before that point have been reflected and committed to that database or so. And um, Flink de- defines these uh, these points in the in the stream periodically. Um, it coordinates them by injecting um, so-called checkpoint barriers in the stream. You can think of them as metadata messages that flow with the stream and, and coordinate exactly the alignment of what should be part of the checkpoint and not and what not with the operators. And it it stores the it stores the the state of the streaming topology as of that checkpoint in the background somewhere in some persistent storage. If it is, if your job is not maintaining a lot of state, it can just be part of Zookeeper. If it is maintaining a lot of state, you probably want to materialize that in HDFS and only keep the metadata in Zookeeper. And so, once you define periodically these consistent checkpoints, in case of a failure, what the system does is it basically just rewinds all operators to the latest consistent point there, and and lets them resume their work. The, the interval in which you do these checkpoints is, I would say, totally application-specific. If you have something that, um, where in a failure case, you want to make sure you don't rewind so fast, you, you'll probably run, run these checkpoints very often. Um, if you have, if you have a, a job that, that goes through a lot of data with super heavy computation, um, where you have, let's say, very heavy windows, and the time that a record travels through the stream is going to take a while, anyways, because it, it goes through so many successive windows or so. You may want to do this a little less often. So, this interval of drawing these checkpoints is, in practice, anywhere between, I would say, 500 milliseconds and a few minutes or so. And yeah, this really defines where the streaming program, how much it, how much it has to redo, or to what point it falls back in case of a, of a recovery. The nice thing about that approach is that um, by itself it adds very little overhead. The only the only cost that that a checkpoint really has is backing up the state of of operators internally. That is, I think, the minimum amount of work you can do for checkpointing. So in that sense, it's 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 really getting to that minimum amount of work that you need to do. And it gives you very strong semantical guarantees, and it allows you to actually extend these semantics if you if you implement certain interfaces also um, towards uh, towards state in the in the uh, in the uh, um, we we say outside the system um, in the outside world to give you to give you these consistent semantics that that every element is reflected once in the state that the elements that are reflected in that state are also reflected in in another state it allows you to extend these guarantees also to the to, to the outside world outside of the streaming system by itself given that 
in the data sources and sinks you implement certain interfaces, which which is very interesting because it it can it can effectively mean that your streaming system becomes something like a distributed consistency or checkpoint coordinator for moving state between multiple databases. Was this method for maintaining fault tolerance? Was this one of the the main breakthroughs that uh, that kind of separates Flink from other streaming systems? It's it's one of them, definitely. Yes, it's. Um, I mean, if you think about it, the the algorithm in the end is not a a super complicated thing. It's it's something that's based on a on a very well known algorithm that is. I think over twenty years old, called Chandy Lampert algorithm. It's a it's a a variation that that we did of it, or um, something tailored to this use case. Um, it is just something that that if you think about it, be- because it gives you this nice property, it's not it's not dealing with any um, with any unnecessary in flight data and so on. It's getting to this minimum minimal kind of state backup work point that you really need to do. Um, yeah. Is, is, is a very is a very good piece for um, for high throughput streaming systems. It is one of the outstanding things in Flink, definitely. Yeah, is that uh, that Chandy Lamport algorithm? Is that snapshot or what? What? Uh, what's the? Do they have an algorithm? For, do they call it or it's called Chandy Lamport? I think it's called the Chandy Lamport algorithm for distributed asynchronous snapshots or so. I don't know. I have to, I have to look up the exact title. So usually okay. people just call it Chandy Lampert. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll find that and put it in the show notes. Um, so how does Flink compare to Apache Spark? Yeah. Um, I think I think it's very simple in the end. Apache Spark is a batch processing system um, and Flink is a stream processing system. So what what Apache Spark does in the head it's in the head it's a it's a batch a batch processor that that transforms and and reorganizes and shuffles data sets. Um, Spark does approximate streaming on top of a batch processor by running these so-called micro batches or so a lot of small uh, batch programs. Flink does it exactly the other way around, if you wish. Right? Flink is a mm-hmm. is a streaming processor at heart and dispatch processing on top of streaming. So if you wish, the Spark stack and the Flink stack are exactly op- opposite. Fascinating. So in practice, Flink works on pages of bytes and Spark works on collections of objects. How does the change, how does this change of, of, of primitives that are being worked on, how does that change the type of operations that are being p- performed within Flink versus Spark? Um, okay, so so two things about that. I don't know what the latest state of Spark is. I think the Spark people have been also changing their internal model a bit. Um, so that that as a caveat, I'm not really an expert on on Spark, especially not on on the later versions. Sure. And, um, so the current version of Flink 0.10, um, it does things slightly differently on the batch and on the on the streaming side. So this working on collections of pages is fully uh, implemented if you run batch programs on top of on top of Flink on the let's say on the operator code that is executed for batch programs. If you run if you run fancy windows on the streaming side, this is still a work in progress to implement them all on these memory pages rather than Java objects. So we're in a bit of a transitioning phase on the. Um, on the streaming side. So let me talk about how it is in the batch side because that is um, that is really how um, that's really the core of the model in Flink that that we'll also go for in the streaming side in the next months. It's just work in progress there. Um, sure. Okay. So the the idea uh, the observation there is the following: um, the JVM has never really been designed for super data intensive work. Um, the the way that the the when you represent massive amounts of data as objects, so you have billions of elements, you represent them as billions of objects. You first of all have quite a bit of an overhead in the representation of the data, as each each object adds overhead. Um, the way that that you that you lay out data, basically with with references between objects, is not very cache efficient. The next part is that if you have a lot of long-lived objects, 
um, the techniques, the garbage collection techniques that Java is built around do not work very efficiently anymore. Java can handle creation of short-lived objects and destruction of short-lived objects at massive scale very well. As soon as you start accumulating a lot of objects and they, they tend to live a little longer, um, these objects drift into something called the tenure generation space of the JVM um, and, and start filling that one up. And when garbage collection of that part become necessary, that is ex uh, extremely costly in the JVM. So the, the, that was the observation that we had and the, the workaround that we tried to do was the following. We tried to, to write the system such that it only really creates a lot of short-lived, uh, only really creates short-lived objects and, and never keeps these objects around very long, but rather than that moves the data of these objects into, into byte arrays that are, that basically live, live forever and therefore never need to be garbage collected. So what, what this effectively means is that, that Flink does not accumulate the, the records um, for, let's make it concrete. Let's say you have a, you have a simple MapReduce style program. It just, um, we're in the reducer, we're collecting elements because we have to sort them. Um, it's, Flink is not collecting these elements in lists and then sorting the list. In, instead of it's taking each element individually, and, and serializing it into, into the, or we call the managed memory. You can really think of it as a, as a collection of byte arrays that live either on the heap or off the heap. And, and so then, then this object can be immediately released, so it's really short-lived. And once, once the data has been accumulated in these byte arrays, it really implements the heavy lifting algorithms um, to work on the serialized data rather than on the objects. So the sorters and the hash tables and Flink, they, they all work on serialized data rather than on objects. And, and by virtue of that, you basically get out of the way of the garbage collector. And in addition, you actually can exactly control how much memory um, you occupy. And you can also easily, once you start exceeding that, move parts of that memory to disk and later move it back into memory. So you, you get very, very robust out of core operation. Okay, very fascinating. We'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, DigitalOcean offers simple cloud infrastructure for developers. In one click, you can have a mean stack, a Rails application, an Ubuntu box, or another custom environment. Software Engineering Daily is proud to have DigitalOcean as a sponsor because DigitalOcean is the simplest cloud service provider. I've interviewed Moisey Oretsky, who is a founder of DigitalOcean, and he told me that DigitalOcean was based on this realization that other cloud service providers are so complicated. If you want things to be simple when you deploy your application, use DigitalOcean. To try DigitalOcean, go to digitalocean.com and enter promo code SE Daily. That promo code is one word, SE Daily. Now let's get back to our show. Uh, so you've mentioned that um, Flink and Spark sort of look at the world in inverted ways. Flink looks at batch processing is a special case of stream processing and Spark looks at uh, stream processing as a special case of batch processing. So would a user ever want to include both Flink and Spark on the same stack? Yeah, actually we see people that do that. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the way that, that both people, that, that, that both actually work flip side, right? Um, it, it means that, they have different sweet spots, right? So, the I'm I'm obviously a bit biased, but I would say streaming is <laughs> in streaming Flink is much stronger. Um, on the other hand, there's uh, there are aspects of batch that Spark is much better than Flink, um, especially when it comes to this um, to this this paradigm of you know you 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 load a data set in memory and you cache it there and you just run a set of uh, of of interactive queries over it. That's a sweet spot for Spark, for example. And if you happen to have both a use case for for stream processing, be that either low latency or be this in the uh, in the in the in the Kappa architecture style that you want to do a sophisticated stateful stuff or windowing, then you have a case for stream for streaming for Flink. If you have interactive queries at the same time in another part of your infrastructure, you have a use case for Spark. There's really no reason why you can't use both. And how does Apache Storm fit into this conversation? How does Apache Storm fit into that? Yes. So um, 
Storm has, has been, in, in some sense, the first streaming system in this uh, Apache big data, big data stack. It is, it's, uh, I would dare to say, a little old by now. I mean, even though it's not really, I don't know, not really older than four or five years. But technology has evolved very, very fast then. So Storm was... Storm was a technology that was solving a problem back then, um, but I think we've since learned a few things on on how to do things slightly differently, and um, get get better performance and semantics and so on in in streaming. So so I would say Storm has been for for Flink definitely um, for some use cases and for some tricks how to do them an inspiration. But I would say that. That this at this point in time, functionality-wise, there most of the time you can do things with Flink that you can do with with Storm. Definitely, while it's not quite the other way around, especially mm. when it comes to to, case, to use cases that that depend on 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 high throughput and stronger semantical guarantees, like exactly once and so on. Got it. Yeah, that's that's my sense. Uh, also, so. Flink has support for what are called iterative algorithms. What is an iterative algorithm? Um, an, an iterative algorithm is an algorithm that does the same thing over and over again until a certain criterion is is reached. I mean, think of it as a as a do until loop in a in a program, right? Um, you do something until a certain condition is reached. A very typical use case for that is is uh, machine learning. You do start with a random model, some parameters, um, with some yeah random initial values, and you do apply a training step that updates these these parameters, makes them move more towards a converged state until they've actually reached a converged state. So do update until a convergence. That is, for example, an, an iterative algorithm. And, and 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 pretty much for, for these kind of algorithms, we, we put these, these primitives in the API that you can define a, a subflow of the program that is repeatedly um, executed until a certain, yeah, typically convergence state has been reached. Right. And um, there's also this notion of uh, where looping occurs. And you in, in Flink, you get this uh, efficiency that you don't get in, in Hadoop, MapReduce, and Apache Spark. So in Hadoop, MapReduce, and Apache Spark, looping occurs outside the system. Can you explain what that means and the difference between that looping outside the system and how Apache Flink works? Yeah. So... So looping out that's outside the system basically um, means that you write this part of the of the of the pipeline of the algorithm that should be repeatedly applied as a program, and then you have let's say really a while loop around it or a for loop around that part that repeatedly takes this, gives it to the cluster and says execute that part, and then once it's done, um, you basically execute you, you basically start the same program again and uh, just make sure that the input of this next iteration is is the data set that was produced as the output of the previous iteration that is how people have been doing these iterative algorithms in in Hadoop forever um, for example a lot of a lot of the algorithms in the Mahout library are implemented like that um, spark went and was um, was cleverer in, in that sense that they said you know this uh, the, the that we have to always read it from HGFS, write it to HGFS is, is a high overhead. Why don't we just, you know, cache it in memory, write it to write it to memory, read it back from memory, and so on. So it's basically programs that it's it's still pr- individual programs that are executed, but they read from memory to a uh, write to memory rather than reading from distributed file system to distributed file system. Um, the the difference in Flink is that the that the entire iterative program looks to the looks to the uh, system really as as one step of of this iterative program with with a feedback channel right so you you basically have each operator in these steps running only one time and then having having actually a cyclic data flow so the the latest point of the of the 
of the pipeline that you iteratively execute actually feeds its its data in a streaming fashion back to the to the first operator and you can you you can yeah basically run a, a cyclic stream of data in in the system that is that is a bit different um, in that sense that all the other systems explicitly restrict the computation to DAX to directed acyclic graphs and and flink has this special form of of feedback which makes the the graphs cyclic they cannot be arbitrarily cyclic but there's there's some form of cycles in the graph that are allowed and that that then express these these feedback uh, data feedback channels got it so let's talk some about the flink apis flink has three apis the data set api the data stream api and the table api That's could right. you describe the usages of these yeah so um, let's start with the data stream API. Um, the data stream API really exposes the, the data streaming, uh, the, the primitives you need to, to write programs in, in a data streaming paradigm. Um, you create, you create streaming sources, you apply functions, you window them. Whenever you want to do aggregations, you actually need to window them in, in data streaming, um, and it gives you these, these flexible primitives for windowing, for maintaining state, and so on. So the data stream API is really for, for the streaming use cases, both the low latency and the more Kappa architectures, trial-style streaming use cases. The data set API um, is really for, for batch programs. Um, it, it basically um, is an API that that says uh, um, we're not trying to force you to write a batch program in a streaming fashion by you know going and and saying okay create create a stream um, I know it's a finite stream so I don't really have to window and so on but it, it's just forgetting about that and, and and giving you only the primitives you it's 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 throwing out all the stuff that you need to do if you have unbounded streams and and makes all the simplifications you can do for yeah for finite data sets for, for batch programs. And it also adds um, some additional functionality in the translation of the program to the to the distributed execution. For example, it applies uh, optimization that that tries to figure out how to reuse sort orders, partitionings, and so on, and in order to speed up execution. Um, because on these bounded data sets, you can make a few more assumptions than on unbounded streams. That is something that is unique to the data set API. Both the data set and the data stream API are really, if you think about it, um, APIs in Java and in Scala where you work with objects in Java and Scala objects. So every time one function, one transformation produces uh, a data element, it, it has to actually describe a, a, a Java class or a Scala class um, or case class or primitive type that, that describes that that object. So it's in that sense, it's it's very it's very physical, right? The the data is exchanged in forms of programming language classes and conceptually objects in practice serialized forms of these objects, but conceptually in forms of objects of and classes of a programming language. The table API is a much more logical thing. Um, think yeah. about mm -hmm. it as as something similar to Microsoft Link um, and. In, in in that in that sense, there's um, there's not really you're not programming with uh, with classes anymore, but you're programming basically with uh, with the logical with logical tuples with names, and you are applying logical operations to that rather than um, rather than implementations of programming language functions. It's it's yeah, I think the the closest analogy I can give you is, is something like like Microsoft Link or in some sense, uh, maybe Hibernate QL or so, something that is conceptually close to SQL without being, you know, just a string that describes everything. It's it's more a, a fluent API in the programming language. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, so Flink also has some domain specific libraries. Can you talk about Flink ML? Yeah. So. Um, and Flink has has two major libraries right now: the the graph library Jelly and the machine learning library uh, Flink ML. So Flink ML is a is a recent effort um, to to basically um, 
built a few of the algorithms that that we have seen that people that people like and need, and then we've actually implemented in Flink in, in such a way that they they become composable and reusable. And the 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 observation is that um, a very handy model in this field is is the model of of um, of pipelines um, that you build uh, that that you build a chain of let's say transformers and preprocessors to your training data that that, that for example um, normalize them scale, scale them um, and so on and then they apply a learner or a trainer and the result of that is a model and then you actually take the same pipeline to apply um, for example if it is a classification model to use that model to classify uh, the the data stream of yeah the target data stream of, of elements that you want to classify so it's 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 building infrastructure um, it's building infrastructure for for exactly that it's a model that is very much inspired by um, by the way that scikit-learn defines um, machine learning pipelines it only deviates a little bit in that it um, that it tries to make things type safe it it uses a lot of of, of Scala's very fancy type system and and implicits to yeah to write to write type safe training and classification pipelines of algorithms. Flink ML is pretty much work in progress right now. A lot of this basic infrastructure is in place. Unfortunately, not a lot of algorithms to pick from have been in, uh, implemented right now. And in the latest release, the Flink community has put a lot of focus on on um, advancing the the features in the streaming space. So the last three months have not seen a tremendous progress on Flink ML. We'd like to change this again in the future because it is a very promising piece that is just um, at this point in time, unfortunately, still work in progress. Sure. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting because if you compare that to like the Spark ecosystem, my understanding is like the, the Spark facilities for machine learning were so appealing. Um, it probably had some some sense compounding interest because people would see the machine learning libraries on Spark and then they would go contribute to Spark and the machine learning libraries would get better and more people would contribute to it. So maybe that's maybe that's uh, in the future for Flink. Yeah, definitely. Actually, people are contributing to this to this pipeline. I think the machine learning library is the component of Flink that has the um, the most open pull requests right now. Oh. Interesting. Can you give me a better idea of what the open source community of, of Flink looks like? Um, yeah. So the the open source community of Flink is actually right now uh, it has grown quite a bit, and it is it is growing at, at at a at a pretty impressive rate right now. It's it's going to to the extent that the committers and PMC members um, have to have to start coming up with better processes to handle the load. Um, we have right now, I think, twenty committers in Flink, um, and they come from they, they come from from various places and organizations. So the company where where I work, Data Artisans, um, it was basically founded out of the Flink community by a, a bunch of committers coming together and founding a company. So um, a lot of Flink committers work at Data Artisans. I think a little less than half of them at this point in time. Other committers come from yeah from academia and also from um, yeah also from industry. From we have a very strong focus still in uh, a very strong community still in, in Europe. So the I would say majority of the committers is in Europe, but we have also committers in Korea and in the U.S. and um, yeah, and we're we're also growing there. So much for the committers. The contributors have I think crossed the 130, 140 line in the in the recent weeks. So um, there's really a there's really an impressive amount of con- contributors right now, and and they're contributing to to all parts of the system, the APIs, um, the tooling, and uh, also the like the internal um, low level algorithms, which is which is very which is very impressive because a lot of them take a long time to dig into, and the the contributors also. Um, Stretch both academia and and industry and and all regions of the world by now. Um, this is a this is something that hasn't always been uh, been that way. I would say that's a development that is more or less happened during has happened during the last year. Or so, where I would say a year ago, 
the, the vast majority of contributors were from Europe, this is definitely no longer the case as of now. So I'd like to begin to close off. Um, I'm very curious where you see data engineering going. What is the future of the Hadoop ecosystem or does Hadoop get supplanted by something else or what what do you see in the future of data engineering? Who uh, predicting the future is always a tough thing to. <laughs> it sure is. Um, so does Hadoop get supplanted? I mean, Hadoop is Hadoop is a stack, right? It's it's more than than one thing. I would say that MapReduce by itself is probably going to be less and less. Um, but Hadoop still also includes, you know, HDFS and HBase and Yarn and all of that, and that that is probably there to stay. Um, I again, I may have a biased view, but I, I see that that streaming is becoming a big part in 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 the Hadoop infrastructure, and that 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 there is a trend right now that people that people realize that you know. Data sets don't, like I said in the beginning, they don't get created as batches. The the inherent na- nature of most use cases is that data is created in a continuous fashion that the time when data was created actually matters um, and that, that, that the programs should actually deal with this continuous nature. And a lot of people start realizing that the pipelines they have built are streaming programs in disguise even though they've built them with batch technology. So my bet is that there's going to be a big shift towards streaming technologies in the in the future. That more and more gigabytes and terabytes of data will be stored in in Apache Kafka, um, as as opposed to to HDFS. I mean, HDFS will will have a, a good chunk of data, but in in, in like in in the, the ratio of data in Kafka is going to go go up in the in the next uh, in the next in the next years definitely. And and with that that more and more of the data processing will move to will move to the streaming paradigm from the batch paradigm. Mm. Where do containers fit in? Where, do, where how do containers fit into the future of Hadoop? How do containers fit in? Um, I mean, in, in in some sense, containers. The the infrastructure pieces Yarn and Mesos are not all that. The idea behind them is not all that different from the idea of containers, as, as far as I understand it, in this this uh, this space, right? So bringing up bringing up containers to have have a have a lightweight way of of running multiple operations, multiple application services next to each other, um, without them interfering, is is not too too different from having operators in in JVMs being brought up by Yarn and Mesos next to each other from different applications. Mm. And I think both Yarn and Mesos actually make use of container technology. I think both of them can use can use, for example, um, both of them play play well together with Docker for resource isolation and so on. So I think it's. Um, Future is now. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's already happening. And in this is again this is again something. The more the more you use you move to something where resources are used in an elastic way. So yarn is bringing elasticity to batch jobs to a large extent. In, in streaming, elasticity will be I think even more important than in batch jobs because if you have a streaming job running twenty four seven and your data rate is not all the same for for all day all all year and so on, you will want to scale in and scale out this this job in order to make, you know, to use as many resources as you need to do to keep up with the current data rate, but not keep so many idling resources if the data rate drops during during the night or during summer vacation time or Christmas. I don't know. And and in that sense, the, the elasticity scaling in and scaling out the resources is, is going to be hugely important for streaming. And that that is where these technologies like be it containers, be it yarn and, and mesos will play play an important role cool so you uh you mentioned that you're working with several flink committers on a company would you care to talk about that company at all sure i can i can do that um so the the company where where i worked at horizons it was founded by um by basically a set of flink committers who have been working on on flink in academia um 
it was still called Stratosphere back then. It was the, let's say, the project that later became Apache Flink. And um, it is it has been the basically the project I worked on during my PhD thesis. Uh, also, another committer worked on it during his PhD thesis, our postdoc um, as well. And at some point in time, we realized that um, we had so much fun um, maintaining the system. We put it open source, and we had so much fun maintaining the system, um, supporting people who who were using it, um, gathering feedback, improving it, and so on. That. That we that we sort of stopped doing research at the university, right? We're just um, <laughs> we're just supporting people and doing open source, and that there was the point in time when 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 this bunch of people um, just uh, left the university altogether and and f- founded a company to yeah to keep on supporting Flink. Cool. Well, Stefan Ewan, thank you so much for coming out to Software Engineering Daily and talking about Flink and Hadoop and the future of data engineering. It's been really enjoyable talking to you. Thanks for, for having me, Jeff. And um, thanks for, for giving giving me the chance to, yeah, to speak and share my opinion on data streaming and Flink. <laughs> <laughs>